Legends of LEDs, are you ready to get glowing? I'm Professor John Gallagher, and in this lesson, we're going to light it up with a spectacular pixel blaze from the wizard at Electromage. Now, if you've seen impressive LED displays, there's a good chance that they're powered by pixel blaze magic. This amazing little board it doesn't use CircuitPython, which my course usually focuses on. Instead, it has a bunch of built-in patterns that you can select, customize, and run in a playlist of any size. The board can be expanded with sensors to respond to sound and motion, and you can add the ability to react to touch and the patterns can be mapped to light layouts of any size from tiny board to wall sized and irregular shapes they scale to the best possible display given the lights available and if you want to cast your own spells with bespoke patterns and layouts there's a javascript subset programming language where you can control the conjuring but this is a newbie friendly lesson no soldering is required so let's spark it up with pixel blaze now there is a Pico Pixel Blaze that's even smaller, but I'm using the Pixel Blaze version 3, which is still diminutive, roughly 1.6 by 1.3 inches. And if you don't solder, you can buy a version with connectors pre-soldered. You'll also need a micro USB cable and a 5 volt power supply. More amps are better. I'm using a 3 amp power supply for this demo. If you're using similar LEDs, you don't want anything smaller than 3 amps. I'll cover more on power in a future lesson, and in this lesson I'm going to show NeoPixel standard lights. These are WS2812B standard LEDs. I bought a bunch of these off AliExpress and some buying supplies for a classroom full of university students. And while I'm showing you the setup with LED matrices, you'll be able to follow along if you have a light strip as well. And if you're new here, welcome. I teach physical computing at Boston College. You can find scores of lessons and challenges for my course that focuses on maker electronics, mostly using CircuitPython, at youtube.com slash at buildwithprofg. Check it out if you want to learn more. Now let the magic begin. Now each of my students gets one of these bad boys, the Pixel Blaze version 3. And I've already soldered the terminal blocks onto this board, but you can also buy them pre-soldered. And the first set of lights that I'm going to attach is going to be this 8x8 NeoPixel matrix. Now there's a DIN or data inline clearly labeled on the matrix, so this is the part that's got to be connected to my Pixel Blaze. Your LED should have come with one of these opposite connectors that have three or four wires, depending on your LED type. This is what you're going to connect to the terminal blocks on your Pixel Blaze board. And this next step is optional, but to hold the wires tight, you can strip a very small bit of silicone from the end of each wire and tin the wire so that there's more for the terminal screws to bite into. And then with the screws loosened, insert the correct wire into the correct hole in the terminal block. For me, white is ground, that's right at the end. Green is signal next to it. There's nothing in clock for these NeoPixel lights. And the red is power at the other end. And I'll plug my micro USB into my Pixel Blaze. And what I'm going to do is work on this wirelessly. So instead of plugging into my computer, I'm going to plug the other end of my micro USB cord into a 5 volt 3 amp power supply. That should be plenty of juice for what I need. And then I'm going to hold down this button for five seconds until I see the amber flash. That's going to cause my pixel blaze to act like a Wi-Fi hotspot. So I can now connect to it using my computer. Now your pixel blaze should be in something called AP mode. And AP stands for access point. And again, that means your pixel blaze is acting as an access point, essentially a Wi-Fi hotspot. So I'm going to go up to my Wi-Fi menu and find Pixel Blaze. And sometimes it takes about 30 seconds or more for this to show up. But if I peek under other networks, I can see a network named Pixel Blaze and some other stuff. So I'm going to select that. And then you might have to wait for another 30 seconds, but you should eventually see a window pop up where you can configure the Pixel Blaze to find and connect to your local Wi-Fi network. Now leave this in client mode. That's what you want to change to. This will let your Pixel Blaze board connect to your Wi-Fi network. It'll no longer be a hotspot. And I see all of my local Wi-Fi networks listed here. So I'm going to select my local network. When you double click on it, you should see it show up in SSID. Make sure that your Wi-Fi network name is in there. Then enter your Wi-Fi password. Click Enable Discovery Service. This is going to let your Pixel Blaze be found within your browser. And click Submit. And you should see a connecting message. And after another several seconds wait, then a note that says that you've connected and you can disconnect from your network, meaning currently the Pixel Blaze, and reconnect to your local network. Now my Mac does this automatically, so if I select my network again, it's actually going to turn off my Wi-Fi. But now that I'm on my local Wi-Fi, I'm going to open up Safari, and I'm going to enter this URL, discover.pixelblaze.com. Now this should show all the Pixel Blaze boards that are on your local network. Currently, I'm only seeing one Pixel Blaze. If I were to run this at school, I'd see dozens and my board still has the generic name. So giving this board a new name is one of the first things we'll change. Now, if your board isn't showing up here, there's a chance that you have to unplug your board and plug it back in. After you do that, you can refresh this Discover page. And if that still doesn't work, you should restart all the steps that I just showed you from the beginning. 
make sure you're on the right Wi-Fi network and you've entered the password correctly. Since I'm looking good, I'm gonna click to access my board and it might take another 30 seconds or so to connect. You might even have to retry this. Sometimes I've found the connection seems to hang, but you should eventually be able to connect to your board. You'll see this cool 3D cube animation and you start off in the patterns tab by default. Now, before we plug in our LEDs and experiment with patterns, we want to make some configuration changes first. So let's head to the settings tab. So in the name field, you see the generic name your Pixel Blaze had. Why don't you give it a new name? I'm going to call mine 18-Pixel Blaze because it's the 18th Pixel Blaze I'm setting up. Then down in time zone, select the closest big city that's in your time zone. For me, that's America slash New York. They don't have Boston in here. This is a pull down menu, but I know that if I type this in with a capital A for America slash capital N for New York, that'll pop up. And if you don't know which cities are available, they're called IANA time zones, IANA time zones. You can search for that online or ask AI for the right choice for you. You can also set an option to turn your pixel blaze on and off at a given time. I'm going to leave that option unchanged, but I am going to limit brightness. Now, the human eye doesn't view increasing brightness linearly. Human eyes actually see brightness changes logarithmically, and 100% brightness is actually way more than you need. For indoor light displays, brightness of really 30 to 40% should be fine. That's also a smart choice because it prevents you from drawing too much power, and if you draw too much power, if you put too much of a demand on your power supply, your pixel blaze might stop working. I'll have more on power concerns in a future lesson. But for now, I'm using an 8x8 LED matrix, so I'm going to use 35% brightness, which should be an acceptable threshold for my 3 amp power supply. Next, under LED type, you should select the standard for the LED lights that you're connecting to. The lights I'm using are NeoPixel lights, and this option also works for any lights that are listed as WS2812 or SK6812. Look on the lights packaging or check with your manufacturer to find out what type of lights you're using. Now, pixels is the number of lights that you're connecting your Pixel Blaze to. My 8x8 matrix has 64 lights. And next, very important, and I forget this all the time, you want to set your color order for your lights. Now you probably know that LED lights typically make colors by mixing red, green, and blue lights at various different intensities. That's what the RGB letters stand for. And most NeoPixel lights actually don't have the setting as you see it here or as RGB. The RGB order for most NeoPixel lights is typically GRB. So I'm going to select that. Now your manufacturer's light specs should indicate the RGB order. And if you can't find it at your manufacturer, you can just experiment until the pattern you select shows the colors you expect. Next, head up to Mapper, and this is where your Pixel Blaze will understand how your lights are laid out. There are a bunch of light layout options built in. You can see these by pulling down this menu, and ring stands for a straight line of lights. That looks especially great if you wrap your lights around in a circle. Matrix is a two-dimensional row-column grid, and that's what I'm using. Now, if you connect multiple matrix panels together, you want to choose a multiple panel matrix. And the other two settings are for cubes. Flat side is sort of like LEDs on a box, and volumetric has the LED lights inside, so you can see all the lights inside the cube. Now there are also a ton of ways that you can map irregular or less common patterns. We won't be covering that in our first tutorial, but remember Electromage has a set of forums where you can ask experts for all sorts of advice. So with matrix selected, I'm going to click on the load example button and some code appears. Now the default that loads assumes that there are eight pixels or LEDs in the width. You see that field here? But you can modify that width up here and the pixel blaze will automatically look at how many LEDs you entered in the pixels field of the settings tab and it'll take care of the rest. Now we're going to work with different mappings later in this lesson, but right now I'm going to work with the 8x8 LED matrix. I also see a pattern over on the right. I'm going to click on save. And sometimes I've found that I need to load and save again. So if you're ever looking at your lights and it doesn't look like they're laid out properly, you can get back into the mapper tab, make sure your selections are loaded. And if they're not showing up, well, you can reload and resave them. And now my friends, it's pattern time. Click that patterns tab so we can get things glowing. Now I need to plug my LEDs in. So I'm gonna find the DIN or digital in connector on my matrix. And I'll connect this to the opposite connector that I screwed in on my board's terminal blocks. And when I do this, Hey, I see very bright patterns show up. Trust me, friends, this looks way better in person than it does on video. Now, one thing you'll notice about this web interface is that the various patterns show what they will look like in a linear or ring mapped set of LEDs. And these lights at the very top of your browser page show in real time what the selected pattern should look like on a linear set of LEDs. This is a great way to see if a pattern matches what you expect. If you don't see what you expect, that might be an indication that some of your settings are off. 
And one of the first patterns that I like to look at is this one here, example color hues. And it's got some solid colors, so it's a great way to see if the patterns that are flashing on the screen after you click on this match up with what you're seeing on your LEDs. And for me, this is looking great. I've got things configured properly. Now at this point, you should feel free to double click on these patterns and try them out. Selecting a pattern should immediately begin executing that on your lights, which is very cool. And again, you can match that with what's showing at the top of the browser. And after you experiment with a few of these, you might decide, hey, I want to create a playlist that repeats a bunch of patterns that I really like. And you can do that. You can just click on playlist up here and that lets you build a playlist of patterns to play continuously. Now you can still double click on patterns to check them out. But if you find a pattern that you like, well, you can just click on the add button that's in that pattern row that adds it to the playlist. And you also have the ability to edit, clone, or export a given pattern, which is a wonderful way for you to learn more about the code behind these Pixel Blaze patterns. You can experiment with things on your own. The Pixel Blaze language is a subset of JavaScript. There's a real-time online editor that you can access through the browser that flags any errors that you might make, but it also immediately shows the results of your working code. And we're going to talk more about writing patterns in a future lesson but I'm going to keep clicking on patterns that I like. I'm going to look specifically for ones that have 2D in their name because those look especially good when they're on an LED matrix. Continue to click on add for the ones that you like. And there are so many good ones, so explore away. Some of these are listed as sound reactive. Those work with a sensor board. I especially like this one, Spiral Twirls 2D. That looks like the arms of a galaxy that are spiraling away. And Spotlights is also cool. You can see it looks like a spotlight that's traveling around in my matrix. And now at this point, let me show you what happens if we quit the browser and I unplug my Pixel Blaze. And let's imagine I come back later. I plug my Pixel Blaze in and my playlist restarts. I don't even have to get into my browser. My Pixel Blaze automatically starts running through any of the presets that I gave it. So hopefully that's got you up and experimenting. And I'll show you just a couple more things before we leave. Now my students also have some other LED matrices. They've got a 16 by 16 matrix. I'm going to head back to configure my pixel blaze at discover.pixelblaze.com. I'm going to head to the settings tab and I'm going to increase the number of LEDs. Remember that's the setting in the pixels field to 256. That's 16 times 16 and I'll lower the brightness to just 15 percent and then I'm going to head over to the mapper tab and with matrix clicked I'm going to click on load again. Now the mapper doesn't automatically update the number of LEDs but smart person that you are if you look at this code I bet you can figure out what to do. Even if you don't understand the code see this line here that says width well now our width is 16 it's not 8 so I'm going to update 16 in here and pixel blaze will automatically adapt to reach to the number of LEDs that's 256 in my matrix so it'll assume that there are 16 rows as well I'll click Save then head over to patterns I can see they look even more ultra cool on the larger matrix of LEDs breathtakingly awesome but the pattern for the spotlight is especially good to check things because when you click that you should see this circle traveling around and that's exactly what I see things are looking great reconfigure accomplished and as we'll eventually see one of the coolest things about pixel blaze is that patterns aren't just a list of dots being turned on or off they're calculated with formulas these patterns are driven by math and because the formula based patterns can adapt to any set of lights no matter the size or shape now once you start coding you're going to see that even with a few lines of code you can generate surprisingly complex and beautiful animations the electro mage site has lots of examples of things that were made with pixel blaze Lastly, let me show you how I connected these two 32 by 8 NeoPixel matrices, one on top of the other. Now, my students get one of these each, but some students might want to combine their matrices with other students or swap them out for their projects. And this is what I did to hook these up. First, it's important to know the orientation of the lights. That means which lights turn on in which order. Do they move left to right or top to bottom? Do they move in a zigzag pattern? So to see how my lights lit up, I first clip the NeoPixel matrices together in this orientation with the in on the back left side and the pixels facing me. The first panel is above the second panel. And note that there's a connector on the back of the panel so that you can connect one to the other. Unfortunately, the wires are very short. You could use jumper wires to wire these together, but I'm going to wrap these eventually around a 3D printed cylinder so the short wires eventually won't be a problem. But when I test things, lying these flat, they're not going to align perfectly together. One is going to be slid over a little bit to the right, but that's going to be okay. Now you can see when I ran simple circuit Python code lighting up all 512 lights on the two boards, I started in the upper left corner, moved down, then up, then down in a zigzag pattern. 
and the board below this moves in the same pattern when it's positioned the same way as the top board. So with knowledge of how my lights light up, I plugged the two panels into my Pixel Blaze, connected to the web app, and I headed over to the Settings tab. I lowered the brightness to 10%, and that's really important when working with so many LEDs and just 3 amps of power. In a future lesson, I'm going to help you calculate power requirements, and I also need to change the number of pixels. So a 32 by 8 matrix has 256 lights, so that's 512 pixels altogether. Then let's head over to the mapper. I'm going to pull down and select multiple panel matrix and select load. Now if you're code savvy and you read through this code, you might recognize that the default is to set up four 8x8 LED matrices. That's not what I have, so we'll change that. But there's also a line in here with a zigzag parameter, and it's initially false. But remember, when I lit up my LEDs in the Pico, I did have a zigzag pattern. So I'm going to change this false to true. And down here, there's a comment. That's what the two slashes mean. And it says, this is where we assemble one or more panels. Now, there are four statements in here. This is the default for the 8x8 eight eight panels, but I only need two of these, two panels, so I'm going to delete two of them. And what these lines do is they set up a panel. There's a function called that's called panel, and it adds or concatenates each panel into a panel map. So this map value is sort of like a list in Python. In JavaScript, it's called an array. Concat just adds a new element that's set up to the array, so we're adding two panels into the map. Now, panel is a function in this code, and if I scroll up, I can learn a little bit about the parameters of the function. There are five values passed in, a panel width, a height, an X or Y offset, and you can also pass in the number of degrees if you need to rotate your panel. So what I got to work in this first panel creation statement, I passed in a width of 8 and a height of 32. I tried to do things the other way, but that didn't work. So 8 and 32 is what I went with. This first panel has no offsets for the X or Y coordinates, and I'm not rotating, so I'm going to leave that 0 as well. Then the second panel is also 8 by 32, but I am going to offset by 8 here. And what that means is when this panel is chained to the panel above it, the zero, 00 point on this panel actually starts in what you would consider position 8. And remember, we're 0 indexed when we count on computers, so the 8 pixels above are 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, so the ninth pixel is going to be pixel 8 here. That's why we have the 8 offset. There's no Y offset, there's no rotation either, so this should work. We'll go ahead and we'll save this, and then we'll head over to our patterns. And one of the best patterns to make sure that you've got things aligned properly is Spotlight. This shows a circle or an oval light traveling between the two panels. Again, I'm not perfectly aligned, but we can see that that Spotlight should be moving smoothly between the two panels. That's looking good. And also Spiral Twirl is another good one to examine. This shows the spiral center point is in between those two panels. Looking great. So now I'm going to set up a bunch of patterns on a playlist. And a friend of mine, Brian Reeves, who works at Boston College's Makerspace, kindly created the design for these snap-together tubes that I 3D printed. They're perfectly sized, so I can wrap my LED matrices around them. If you like the design, I've got a link in the video description. I attached my LED matrices to the back of these with some sticky Velcro. I threaded the wires below. I'll probably eventually 3D print a base, or I'll laser cut a stand. But you can see, when the two panels are oriented in this cylinder, it looks great. So here are all three examples that I created, the 8x8, the 16x16, 16 16, and the two 32x8s. Looking fabulous, very easy to set up, and all the patterns I'm showing here were already created. They come with Pixel Blaze, but you can also search online and download other patterns. If you find one you like, you can just head to the Edit tab and open an existing file, save the pattern, and now you've got even more goodness. So hopefully you got things working, but if you ran into problems, remember the good folks at ElectroMage have a set of forums online where you can post questions and you'll get some friendly answers. So I hope you've enjoyed this lesson. Please let me know in the comments. Dropping a like is a kindness. And if you like creating projects with Maker Electronics, my entire university physical computing course is online and free. It's very newbie friendly. Educators, you can use all of this in your own classes. It's there for you. And independent learners, you've got what essentially is a university course available for you to follow for free. Now, I also have another course where I teach students how to build iPhone apps in Swift UI. That's online as well. Gorge at that learning buffet and get out there and make something awesome.